So good morning and welcome to those of you worshiping with us at our Rhinelander campus and to those of you who decided to join us online from some other location or at some other time. In the words of Jim Carrey, for you from The Truman Show, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Well, let me begin by saying that Pastor Josh mentioned last week uh, that because of some scheduling issues, our passage for today is actually taken a little bit out of order, preceding the message he taught on. So hopefully, you're prepared to engage in our non-linear, non-chronological approach and receive this message not so much as part of a timeline, but rather as the final piece of a puzzle that's going to complete what many scholars believe to be the greatest chapter of the greatest book of the Apostle Paul's spirit-filled life. So if you have a Bible, please turn to Romans 8, 26 to 30, and follow along as I read. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray for, we we do not know what to pray for, as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that we might be the firstborn among, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Thanks be to God for this, his word. In these verses, we see God involved in our lives in at least three important ways. In verses 26 to 27, we see God the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, specifically with regard to prayer. In verse 28, we see that God the Father works out all things for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. In verses 29 to 30, we see the Father conforming us to the image of God the Son. If you were here at St. Germain last week, you may have noticed that I was not. I was in Louisville, Kentucky, competing along with my oldest son in my final triathlon of the season. And while I was there, even though things went largely as I expected them to go, I did not expect to come home with an illustration of Paul's use of the very first word of this text before us, that word being likewise. It happened like this. My triathlon coach is my son. His coach is a man named Nick. Nick and I had a conversation and As we chatted, he explained to me that his only goal for the weekend was to help one of his athletes, Brandy, simply complete the 70.3 miles of swimming, biking, and running. Now, I have to admit that when I first saw Brandy, that's her with her arms raised in the picture, my first judgmental impulse was to think, Not only will she not finish this race, but she really has no business competing in a half Ironman at all. My suspicions were confirmed when I got word that she had been pulled from the run course because she did not reach the cutoff point in the allotted time. Now, imagine what my response might be if my son, after seeing this, came to me and said, 
Dad, I need to quit coaching, but it's okay, because in the same way that Nick has been coaching Brandy, likewise, he can help you. Once again, I have to admit that my first judgmental response would be to tell him, how can I possibly accept Nick's help as my coach when his athletes not only do not finish, but his athletes really have no business competing in a half Ironman at all? To which my son would have wisely responded, but Dad, do you know Nick and Brandy's backstory? Did you know that two years ago, Brandy decided to change her unhealthy lifestyle because she wanted to become strong enough to love and support her family, including her grandchildren, as she got older? And did you know that on that day, two years ago, her first training session involved a one-mile walk? that she completed in 23 minutes, completely and utterly exhausted. And did you know, Dad, or stop to think about the fact that Nick has helped Brandy train for the last two years so that today she could complete a 1.2 mile swim, a 56 mile bike ride, and a five and a half mile run. Did you know? that when Brandy was pulled from the course, that Nick and several Ironman volunteers gave her her own private victory celebration for finishing 62.7 miles of swimming, biking, and running. And did you know that because he was with her every step of those 62.7 miles, Nick even though he went on to finish the full 70.3 mile distance in her honor, did not even get credit for it. So knowing all that, Dad, would you accept Nick as your coach so that in the same way he helped Brandy likewise, he can help you? You see, likewise is not a word that should be disregarded, whether in the story of Nick and Brandy or in this introduction to our message today, because likewise communicates that whatever was true previously will be true moving forward. There is a backstory. And the backstory is that Paul begins this section with the word likewise, because these verses are merely a continuation of what he's been telling us all through chapter 8 with regard to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. For example, if we go back to verse 2 of chapter 8, we read, The law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. If we go back to verse 5, we read, Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. If we go back to verse 11, we read, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. If we go back to verse 16, we read, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. And so we see the Holy Spirit sets us free, sets our minds on himself, dwells in us and bears witness that we are God's children. Now Paul says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, specifically when we do not know what to pray as we ought. We all suffer, don't we, from a sense that we sometimes simply do not know what to pray or how to pray. Be encouraged, Paul says, because just like the Holy Spirit helps us in all these other ways, likewise, he will help us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit is right here when we do not know what to pray as we ought. The Holy Spirit is right here interceding for us with groans too deep for words. He is right here interceding for us according to the will of the Father. 
Speaking of which, one of the most quest common questions I have personally about prayer is whether I actually am praying according to the will of God. One of the most challenging times of Kay's in my life was the decision we had to make in 1994. We'd been working with Campus Crusade for Christ, now crew, and the Seattle ministry office we were part of was moving to Singapore. Now, we were fairly certain we did not want to go to Singapore and that this might be an opportunity to move closer to family in the Midwest. But should what we want play a part in what God's will was for our life? I actually had this twisted sense and belief that if what we wanted was to move closer to family, then it couldn't possibly be God's will. This wrestling continued for months before a friend sat us down and reminded us that even though God's will for our lives is not always what we would like the most, sometimes he actually does give us the freedom to choose that which would be most pleasing to us, knowing that it is also his will for our lives. This passage was a tremendous encouragement. Because of what is written in the second part of that verse, verse 27, where it says, the Spirit himself intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul's encouragement to us is to meditate on this passage and to remember that even if we are not totally sure what to pray for as we ought, the Holy Spirit of God does know the will of the Father perfectly and intercedes according to his will on our behalf. Pastor Lloyd Ogilvie agreed with Paul in this sense when he wrote, the unspoken prayer of the uninformed opinion springing from the unformed mind is valid when prompted by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Let me read that again. The spoken prayer of the uninformed opinion springing from the unformed mind is valid when prompted by the Holy Spirit. In other words, we can be totally unsure about what we're praying for, but even so, we can pray boldly because the Holy Spirit of God is praying for us. And if you're like me, of all the specific prayers I do pray, perhaps one of the most difficult to believe is whether God is, in fact, working out every detail of my life for good. Look at verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now, does that mean that everything actually is good? Does this mean that everything actually feels good? No, it does not. But what it does mean is summarized well by Alfred Lord Tennyson in a poem he wrote called In Memoriam. He says, Life is not as idle ore, but iron dug from central gloom and heated hot with burning fears and dipped in baths of hissing tears and battered by the shocks of doom to shape and use. Have you ever experienced the gloom of life and didn't know how to pray? Have you ever experienced the burning fears and hissing tears of life and didn't know what to pray? Have you ever been battered by the shocks of doom and didn't know how or what to pray? I can tell you that I have. 
1997, I experienced what I now know to be a panic attack. That experience sent me into a 10-year emotional tailspin, which, except for Kay, a few close friends, and medication, could have sent me to the psychiatric ward. Are things better now than they were back then? Absolutely. Is everything lollipops and roses for me since then? Absolutely not. Did I learn a few things about God, about myself, and about my relationship to Christ that I could never have learned any other way? Unquestionably. I was heated hot with burning fears. I was dipped in baths of hissing tears. I was battered by the shocks of doom. Why? It took some time, but I believe I learned that he allowed those things in my life in order that he might shape and use me. Do you believe God uses every experience in your life to shape and use you for his glory and your good? Once again, here's the encouragement. Even if you don't know how or what to pray as you ought, the Spirit does. He knows the will of the Father, and the Father's will is for his glory and your good. But keep in mind that there are two conditions stated here that must be true before God will work things together for good. The first is that you love God. The second is that you have been called according to his purpose. Look at verse 28. If you do not love God, you cannot expect him to work out all things for good. If you are not living according to his purpose, you cannot expect him to work out all things for good. So maybe today, right now, right here would be a good time and good place to settle those two questions in your mind. Say to God, I love you and mean it from your heart. Say to God, I want to live according to your purpose and mean it from your heart. Then be confident that whether it seems like it or not, whether it feels like it or not, God is, in fact, working all things out for his glory and your good. But what is this good that God is working out? Well, I think all we need to do is keep on reading. Verses 29 to 30 say, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is 120 proof, triple distilled, unadulterated Apostle Paul. In just two verses... He makes us attend a postgraduate seminary class that includes five theological terms that summarize pretty much the entirety of God's involvement in our lives from eternity past to eternity future. So let's jump into the deep end and see if we can at least see a few inches below the surface of Paul's theological depths. He begins by, in verse 29 by saying, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. 
what exactly are God's foreknowledge and his predestination? The Moody Handbook of Theology tells us when the Bible uses the word foreknowledge, it means more than intellectual knowing. The word foreknow really means to forelove. This is knowing in the deepest and most intimate sense. In other words, since God's love is eternal, he loved us before he created us. He foreknew us. The Moody Handbook goes on to explain, suffice it to say that the Bible clearly teaches that nothing in God's foreknowledge denies the necessity of human responsibility and that nothing, can ever, nothing we can do can ever detract from God's omnipotence. In God's foreknowledge, in his forelove, he predestined us. Now, I'm not sure anybody fully understands this concept of predestination. But I do clearly see that the Bible teaches two seemingly contradictory things. One, that God is absolutely sovereign. And two, that individuals have a choice. Interestingly enough, the Bible makes no attempt to explain or define predestination versus human choice. It merely reports that both are eternally true and that somehow they actually do work together. Maybe Charles Spurgeon can shed a little bit of light on this. He said, If I were to declare that humans are so free to act that there was no precedence of God over their actions, I should be driven to atheism. But if I declare that God so overrules all things that humans are not free enough to be responsible, I am driven to fatalism. <clears throat> While these two truths can never be welded into one another on any human anvil, they shall be in eternity. They are two lines that are so nearly parallel that the human mind that shall pursue them furthest will never discover that they converge. But they do converge, and they will meet somewhere in eternity, close to the throne of God, whence all truth does spring. The bottom line is that whatever predestination is, it is not the what that we should be most concerned about but rather the why. Why did God predestine us? Remember what Paul says in the second half of verse 29? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. His foreknowledge and his predestination are meant to conform us to the image of Jesus. God is in the process right now and will ultimately complete the process of making me and making you like his son. Then in verse 30, he says, And those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So foreknowledge, for love, lead to predestination. Predestination leads to calling. So what does it mean to be called? Again, whatever else it means, it means that God is always previous. He draws us to himself, pursuing us. C.S. Lewis was known to have called God the hound of heaven. He is always on our trail. And this call, according to verse 30, 
comes for our justification and our glorification. You've probably heard Pastor Josh talk a lot about justification. The book of Romans is full of this word over and over. Justification is that process by which we are declared to be righteous. This does not mean, however, that we are declared innocent. We are guilty. But we are declared to be free from the penalty that we rightly deserve. Why? Because that sentence that we should have otherwise served has already been served. It has been erased. We deserved death. But since Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, we don't have to die. Think about it this way. <clears throat> you get pulled over for speeding as you drive from Woodruff to St. Germain on Highway J. Incidentally, Pastor Tom, who is on one of his regular rides on that route, directs your eyes to one of the clearly posted speed limit signs and giggles just a little bit. Anyway, you decide to fight the $500 speeding ticket you just got because your father is the county judge. You go to court, plead your case, but are perplexed when your father brings the gavel down and says, guilty, $500 or five days in jail. He is, after all, an honorable and just judge. But before you panic, the judge, your father, stands up, takes off his robe, folds it over the chair, comes to your side and writes a $500 check made payable to the county court and gives it to you. You are guilty. The penalty must be paid. Not even you deny that. But what you momentarily forgot was that even though the judge, your father, is honorable and just, he is also gracious. What he did for you is the very definition of justification. Even though you are declared guilty of the crime, you have been declared righteous because someone else paid the penalty. Paul then says that justification leads to glorification. Basically, this has to do with what we will become when our physical life on earth ends. Glorification is the final stage of our spiritual development. Scholars have noted, however, that there seems to be an omission from this series of theological words, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification, all have to do with the work of God in our lives. But someone has asked, where is the word sanctification? Why does Paul seemingly jump from justification, freeing us from the penalty of sin, directly to glorification, freeing us from the presence of sin. What about the power of sin in my life? How does God deal with that? Well, I believe he's already spoken about sanctification, which is that process of freeing us from the power of sin. I believe Paul dealt with that in verse 29, where he says, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. To progressively be conformed to the image of his son is the definition of sanctification. So why would Paul take the time to use a fancy theological word to define what he has already explained? 
So, is everything clear? Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, the assumption of sanctification and glorification. Got them all down? Well, just to make sure, and those of you who are watching online will be thankful that you're not here, the ushers are going to pass out quizzes to each of you. You'll be given three minutes to complete it, and those who fail to define these words will correctly will be assigned a preaching spot right here sometime in the next six months to tell us what you've learned. So let's summarize this passage of Scripture in the simplest possible terms. One, we sometimes, perhaps quite often, find ourselves weak regarding prayer. Two, we can be encouraged. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Three, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans that the Father listens to because the Father knows the mind of the Spirit and the Spirit knows the will of the Father. Four, the will of the Father is to work all things for good if we love him and if we are called according to his purpose. Five, the Father foreknew, predestined, and called us to be justified, freed from the penalty of sin, sanctified, freed from the power of sin, and eventually glorified, freed from the presence of sin once and for all. Romans chapter 8 began, There is now therefore... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Chapter 8 closes with, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And sandwiched, between the first and last verses of chapter 8 are words that should encourage us in so many ways. God the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness and prays for us even when we do not know what or how to pray as we ought. God the Father works out all things for our good if we love him and are called according to his purpose. The Father, in his foreknowledge, predestined us and called us to be conformed to the image of God the Son. Let's together rest in those eternal truths today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to strengthen us to help us when we are weak, especially when our prayers are weak. Cause us to trust you as you intercede for us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we might be conformed to the image of your Son as you work out every detail of our lives for your glory and our good. Thank you for calling us, for justifying us, for sanctifying us, and for eventually glorifying us in the heavenly places, together with you, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.